Rüdiger Weiß begrüßen. Und I'd like to introduce Rüdiger Weiß, who is a professor from Berlin. And he wanted to be announced like this. And uh, sustainable blockchains is the topic that he will talk about. And the subtitle of this talk is ganz weit oben auftaucht ist nachhaltige Blockchain Sustain. digital und dreckig um, sustainable blockchains instead of digital and dirty also vielen dank vielleicht zum unter thank you anmerkung des uh, one remark this headline was not chosen by me but by the german foreign broadcasting station deutsche welle uh, someone kind of teased me by saying that if you Google digital and dirty, you'll find this interview in Deutschlandfunk. And that is just one from the bizarre features of the blockchain world. And like other topics uh, where people have a strong emotional <coughs> attachment, there is a kind of funny uh, situation where all the people that had a scientific approach to the issue uh, and weigh up the pros and cons, they are then invited by the pro and con people to panels, one after the other, and uh, they may then be facing attacks for the opinions they bring forward. But as a scientist, a computer scientist, you should keep calm and understand the technology. And that is surprisingly simple when it comes to blockchain. Uh, because, uh, and that's why I started my first slide by saying simple and old. A blockchain is a chained list of blocks with hash pointers. And that is one of the most simple structures that you can learn in one of the first semesters in computer science as a really introductory example. And uh, that is quite interesting. One thing that can be explained in just a few minutes of a lecture by mixing a few other influences and uh, and by mixing it with some other influences, it became in very interesting technologies. But as computer scientists, let's approach it and think how you can establish a secure ledger note-taking. And that has been a topic that's been debated in computer science for a number of years. One of the defining papers that's always quoted is from 1990 how to timestamp a digital document and in the hacker scene there are some interesting experiments one is by Ross Anderson from 1996 and even more I had to smile when an old uh, very old hacker he was still uh, he was already old when I came into the scene in 1990 that's Lutz Donnerhacke he also produced a, an eternal log file and that must have had a strong influence because the standard URL that I uh, have quoted here is uh, old assets, that's how it starts. <laughs> uh, and that's been around for decades and the, even the people that ran this uh, have always regarded this as an old <laughs> issue, an old burden. <laughs> and the surprise then was that Bitcoin developed so strongly later. So what happened with Bitcoin? From literally nothing, suddenly there was a currency system that if you look at these usual exchange forums and try to approach Still, there is a three-digit billions of uh, currency units uh, strength that Bitcoin has. And of course, a lot of criticism has been raised about the energy consumption of that technology. And one of the decisions that led to the decentralization of the system and the um, software quality is a bit gru grueling if you look at it uh, as a hacker, of course, with your your judgment is kind of strong, tends to be. And what I would summarize my comments as would be, please do it again properly. 
And the interesting thing is that some simple, uh, some small decisions at the bit level had strong social and economic implications uh, in uh, this currency system. Now, let's try to order the problems to some extent. And as the first and most important issue, I would raise data protection. Bitcoin is a system, Bitcoin is a system where a public transaction ledger exists and it's distributed worldwide, so everything is open. And by definition, things that are written into there cannot be deleted. So, for all eternity, in a sense that you will have to define sensibly, of course, but it's all public, open, it cannot be deleted, there's no right to be forgotten. And if you look at, if you would make up a data protection nightmare, then Bitcoin is quite an interesting candidate. Now, the people that defend the system say, well, there are pseudonyms, and about that I have to say, well, that is kind of deceiving as a sense of security. Pseudonyms are the last uh, line of defense, really, and to some extent, in some aspects, it is a deceptive kind of descent. I've uh, uh, just noted one item here. Uh, it can be attacked with simple graph theory and even perhaps, in quotes, artificial intelligence to add another buzzword. So you could look at the whole transaction data and uh, see if and if I'm a bit eccentric, the whole Bitcoin transaction still fit into the RAM of my computer. So if you look at the whole thing, I'm not looking exactly, but they grow at a somewhat mild rate. You can almost have it all in RAM and then run certain algorithms on it. Another question then is, how long will this stay legal? Even the use of pseudonyms is doubted in many areas in the world. Uh, right. Now, concerning data protection, it is problematic. Another, uh, another interesting aspect is to really consider what the philosophy behind it is. And that is quite interesting because, of course, Bitcoin comes from a libertar libertarian mindset and uh, there are people that are called that are called crypto anarchists or capitalism anarchists. It's quite interesting what mixtures of political ideologies there are these days. And the debate whether these people are more happy with or without a state, in particular without a strong state, that is one of the oldest philosophical debates. And that is a very interesting debate as well, which uh, to sharpen one's mind, one really should get into and uh, try and understand the different positions and make up one's mind about their own position. But we are all hackers, therefore we tend to say philosophy is all nice and, and good, and, but we have to produce something to attack some, some real problems. And the interesting thing is, apart from the question whether it's good, whether uh, if a state does not exist anymore, what do we do in areas where there is no functioning state? where there is no banking, a reliable banking, where there is no state or social control about who can actually join the game. And that is an interesting point that simply got raised by a simple question asking. I am rather clear in my mind that uh, an interesting from a computer scientific point of view, what's interesting is that there are computers communicating here, and the question then is who is allowed to use these computers? And is therefore, and that is quite strongly linked to the question of access as a whole. And that is a debate where I at one point thought, well, it might be surprising to some people, but the spread of mobile phones is about one per person on the planet at the moment. But when it comes to bank accounts, that is much less accessible. So it is an interesting scenario where the possession of a 
phone, however, however simple, it doesn't have to be that smart. SMS messaging might be enough. Well, that gives you an, uh, an opportunity of access. And that, from a hacker's point of view, was led to the thought, well, yes, it's discrimination-free, everyone can use it. And this, this hacker ideal is not just abstract, uh, it's not just important in an abstract sense, because there are enough countries where, for example, women cannot open a bank account without a male relation uh, giving consent or something. So is this free of discrimination? But there is an interesting dynamic then too, because also children gain access and that can lead us to the debate, oh great, now children have this freedom, yes, but you can get the situation where people that want to uh, have run, run businesses then try to capture children and, and, and empty their accounts by ringtone subscriptions, which happened in Kenya. Uh, the, these nice abstract issues, is it, does it make sense to give children access to bank accounts? That is not an academic debate. We have had developments that even the Kenyan government had to take note of. Still, this is a technology that, it, in principle, allows access to anyone. In my, my view, it needs to be shaped and should be shaped. So this discrimination-free property that uh, people, creatures of all kinds, can have the key to an account, that is a small but not unimportant game changer in this area. Now, if you consider that even a non-smartphone gives people access, then at a very abstract level you can say that possibly with blockchain and digital uh, trust structures you can build structures that have very few requirements in the analog world and can be used. And that means that there are some interesting possibilities that I would like to talk, uh, get into in this talk. Um, maybe at the end uh, of the talk, a few words on the things that I want to talk about uh, in this talk, I talk about how we can uh, take an existing system and and some uh, reduce some environmentally uh, damaging aspects. And I would also I want also to discuss um, another system that um, has different um, mechanics. Um, and I already talk, talked about some things at the last Congress about using more intelligent mining algorithms and, uh, and there were proof-of-stake or proof-of-work systems that um, had no energy consumption for the mining of the uh, coins and both things are being researched and I already talked about this at the last Congress and from a hacker's perspective um, we have considered that we have the technologies but what do we actually create with it and if you look at the bank systems there is not really an academic uh, discussion um, if you take M-Pesa uh, which started in Kenya um, which was a cooperation with Vodafone and in, sehr vielen Bereichen durch and in many areas it was uh, a positive recept received very positively and so we can see that there have been some positive developments in with these projects but we still have to think critically about these um, projects and e and even in these cases the government is actually not opposed to these uh, things and even just these three things that I um, have selected here are a bit drastic so even in the poorest countries of the world um, 
there are so uh, in Kenya um, the most poorest actually have to um, mm. and yeah so they still have to pay transfer fees which are considerable and if you think about old mafia movies you know there was um, the mafia fees of for for um, keeping us for staying protected against the mafia and so this is um, so you have to pay quite a lot of fees for these things and at the same time you have major wins and I am old enough to so where um, where um, there was no bad connotation of and it is simply not acceptable if the poor uh, have to pay fees of that amount of, of that on that scale and uh, if people that just transfer micro amounts have to pay the most. That is simply not acceptable. That is rather indecent even. So that is an issue where you can argue, yes, even small amounts cause effort, but if you have 27% uh, profit and if you're in a poor country, then maybe you, if we are just talking cents, maybe just out of the goodness of your heart you could waive those fees and uh, that's an appeal that people should not operate this services just to optimize profit and I've uh, also extended my talk at short notice by adding this in May 2019 concerning data protection in May 2010 19, um, there was the, so what is data protection? We have now the issue that these personal data are with private companies and of course we always say what private companies have, the secret services have as well, but then, then there is issue number two, what the secret services have, hackers will shortly afterwards have as well and exactly that happened because in May 11.5 uh, million records of users were offered on the black market. The interesting thing now in, in this was, well, 11.5 million is impressive enough, but if you look closely, these are just the noblest, the, the most valuable data sets. These 11.5 million are not just names and all kinds of private and, and, and security relevant data. This was done professionally. These are people that run gambling services and betting services, and there are lists um, with den, uh, saying what these, what kinds of transactions these people had made. So, as I said, if you just if you, for example, register a, a, a betting company according to the laws of the German state of Schleswig-Holstein, for example, then you'll have some interesting opportunities there. That is not a cynical remark, it's just an analysis of how things work. So if these 11.5 11 million are just the data, which is the, the elite kind of the data, then let's just assume that these are not the only data that, that have gone astray. If it's uh, and maybe much cheaper, the other 30 million could be bought for a for because they have to, they are just peanuts. So, the old dilemma: if data are created, the private businesses will sell it, secret services will have it, prosecution authorities will have it. But good or bad news, however you want to see it, these data can then find their way through some kind of channels. They have a certain value. And not all hackers in the world just dream about having badly paid academia positions or run nice illumination in camps. 
versuchen, da mit diesen Aktionen Geld zu There are people that want to make money out of these activities and you have to assume that there are people with skills that can get at the data and the usual hacker saying, well, yeah, data will always be hacked, sorry, no, with M-Pesa we've just seen it in May, just a few months ago. So again, the remark, if you do not have data protection friendly constructions then the data will be gone and it will go astray and I, I doubt whether society is mature enough to deal with the uncovering of all kinds of data without severe disruptions coming as a result. Now, since we are at that point, of course, then that leads us to something that is even more interesting. Uh, Facebook Libra, some people in my surroundings got quite enraged about this. Capitalists are now capturing, taking over emancipatory technologies. Well, yes, as, they, as it always happens. And the situation, of course, is what has to be told to the capitalists. These movements do come from an anarcho-capitalist area, so that is kind of that kind of weakens the whole point anyway. But now let's approach it from a scientific and neutral point of view. Techno markets have a tendency to become aware of technologies and try to make a profit out of those. Not a surprising thing to say. And if there are ideas to run this all democratically without banks, without services, uh, the service companies will still look and see what they can use. And in the case of Libra, what's very interesting is, uh, if you take a step back, this truly is an attack on one of the most valued companies in the world, by one of the most valued companies in the world, which is Facebook, to financial services. They are building a new currency in the beautiful country of Switzerland, which, uh, which is covered uh, by a pool of currencies and there are players uh, involved uh, in, uh, in the club. Well, the membership of the club costs 10 million, I think, and then some people were then calculating and said if they, if Facebook is, if they have a 2 billion account on Facebook and just 1% of the users take part, just to compare that with the size of the largest German banks or the international banks, you can see where this can lead. Again, again the debate of data protection, whether it's state or private uh, actors, you could say that this is the worst of both worlds. Facebook will have the data, they will sell it on, they will have the connections to secret services. So we've seen in the case of M-Pesa, Vodafone is not a small or medium enterprise. Uh, if there are 11.5 million premium, da premium data sets, then it's quite unlikely that not all of the data has kind of escaped. I wouldn't say that M-Pesa has a system that only sees those premium data sets. I don't know. I, I don't even want to know. But uh, whatever explanation led to this breach could, Good. <laughs> could unsettle parts of the population, to quote a former German interior minister, Thomas de Maizier. Now, another issue uh, that I would like to add, fairly simple thoughts, but in a hacker camp, uh, a hacker camp is a good place to throw these points into the debate. Again, these protocols do mandate further research because the um, question of energy consumption can may be solved and uh, I would point to my last Congress talk in that regard. But what I would like to say specifically about sustainable development in blockchain, I have two ideas there and the one is, and I've tried to 
use a defining word, infrastructure-free mining, in particular mining with regenerative power sources. And there are some surprising properties in the protocol that are somewhat friendly towards solar and wind power. And you should perhaps also dream to have the idea of self-financed cloud servers by making the blockchain conduct useful proof-of-work calculations. If you have countries with a problem in their banking systems, problems in their computer industry, computer infrastructure, why not combine this? Of course, this is not the hacker spirit. Hackers just build something in a weekend and build a miner and then and then just throw it into the desert and, and suddenly the whole world becomes nice and comfortable. But still, a few thoughts and maybe even calculations should be made to that end. Now, let's look at regenerative power sources, regenerative energies, and the requirements of mining. And mining, interestingly, has a constant power consumption. There are far less fluctuations. Of course, they do exist, but much less fluctuation, even over a longer time scale, than the energy consumption of a modern social economy. In, to that regard, the options for regenerative energy sources, which always uh, supply a certain base need, uh, is there for them to be used. The option is there. Because this really works with a constant power consumption, and that is a property that solar and wind power have as well. Solar and wind power have strongly fluctuating um, power generation, and people that in my early days found, found nuclear power interesting, they thought it's going to be so cheap that you don't even have to have power meters anymore, which not wasn't quite realistic, but I'm still smiling. If you then let the engineers play around a bit, then truly we did have the situation that power wasn't just free, but even had a negative price. Because, as I said, the situation is that we may have too much power in the grid sometimes. And the idea then is to maybe use the excess power directly for mining. Uh, the second issue is uh, maybe a bit of a coarse analysis, but places that are suitable for power generation are mostly in places where you don't, you tend not to want to live because there are storms there, there is too much sun. And therefore it's quite interesting to say, well, maybe there are places that have a lot of sunlight and we can directly use that power. That might be interesting, but maybe. But, but then how do we transport and store this energy? That is very, very expensive. And if you then, as a hacker, look at the situation and say, hang on, how much infrastructure do we need for mining? What properties does this infrastructure have? And the interesting thing, if you analyze the mining system, the interesting thing is that some properties are not so apparent. One property is that it is friendly for mining pools. If you describe Bitcoin mining, then you keep saying that these are lottery tickets and you have to calculate some random numbers. But, well, the law of large numbers there comes into play. If you have a system like Bitcoin, which is friendly for mining in pools, then you do not have to wait and hope for some random lucky event. You can use mining results and have them delivered and continue from them. All right. So let's approach the idea of solar mining mesh networks. What requirements to participate in Bitcoin mining. I'll now use Bitcoin as the leading currency, use it as a placeholder for all the others. Uh, but 
Since Bitcoin allows this, the situation is much better than you might think. And that gets us back to the hacker idea. In principle, you can set up a solar power station in the desert, throw it into the desert, and as an outside connection, you need one satellite connection. If GSM exists, which in many situations, let's let's take GSM. So this very abstract situation, you just throw one computer into the hottest desert where there is no where no life form would like to stay for any extended amount of time, establish a satellite link, the power for the satellite link we can generate as well. And these are things where many people might say, well, let's calculate if it's going to be worth it, production of all this. But I would say, well, yes, you've understood. We have to calculate. Let's do this. Let's calculate what is possible and what is not. I'm not saying that it can solve the world's problems, but this basic idea, the fact that we have a situation that quite fits the model I've just set up, it it's quite imaginable that we build solar mining stations and put them into the desert and, and connect them to satellites. And as I said, hackers can dream. And for long enough, I have been thinking this through to be able to say this is not an absurd idea. Well, I'm a professor. I have the right to have strange ideas, but apart from that, I do really consider this something where you, that you can think of. And at a, on a net political evening of the Digitale Gesellschaft, I linked up with someone from a solar uh, generation project. He introduced systems where they can have trucks with solar panels that really went to African villages in different African countries and supplied services there. And then they had, so it's still planning or being discussed how they do the token system, but there are people working on it. That was quite impressive and I got to know um, some other people um, when I was invited to a ministry and I'm a mathematician and there were two numbers that really moved me. So, so the, the transaction fees are really affecting the poorest of the people and, and 600 million people have no reliable access to energy or to power. And I have to say, and if you have the, then the yeah, most radical idea is that we give access to power to these people. And solar power is, is something very obvious because of the strong solar um, radiation. And something that I also uh, consider is, uh, and of course there is no infrastructure in these places right now. And if we do it in places where there is few population, then you don't really have much reliability. And ev and of course you have people who just uh, collect scrap metals and who might scavenge um, whatever we drop there. And and if we and what we want to do is um, use CO3 free um, power to do the mining and 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 I have to say that and if we only have like a reasonable mining project that gives us more solar power then then this is also a win. And these are things where I say, let's just consider this. D don't be too pessimistic about the re reality. Yes, I know if we do the calculations, then it's, it turns out it's not so easy uh, on an economic level. But still, if there are so many uh, possibilities and opportunities that are unused, um, that will also heat up 
um, the planet, then if we could divert some of that energy or, or heat, then this is not a bad idea. And yes, let's have some more ideas. And um, if you think about the calculations for the, or the, the if the builds for the mobile uh, connections, you could pay these with the power that you produced. And during the day, you could uh, produce solar power and d during the night you could then take advantage of the uh, money that you've earned. And if we make the systems more intelligent, then that's something worth thinking about. And the other fundamental approach is, um, is that Bitcoin involves a lot of efforts um, to do a lot of calculations based on random numbers and what I found uh, interesting is um, an alternative which is um, proof of uh, s space and I think in the next couple of weeks and months we will have some more interesting um, results. So for instance there's Permacoin which combines um, distributed storage with payment systems and if you have, f and for the people who evaluate economic um, success, they they are these are these people are willing to pay for this. So the ICO um, managed, so the ICO for Falcon managed to acquire a three-digit mil millions um, uh, fundraising. And Therefore, I think that young people can look into it and maybe come up with some good ideas. And I want to give you the uh, an overview again. So you get the consensus by um, by making s storage space available and and if you want to combine consensus with useful social um, actions uh, then everyone wins and if you if yeah and if you combine these things then you you become part of this reward system instead of just randomly calculating hashes you actually do something worthwhile with the energy and you have more influence on the system just by doing it. And I I don't want to call this a win-win scheme, which, but uh, um, but it I would be quite annoyed if people actually called it like this, um, because then the big countries would um, use more energy than smaller countries. And one of the promising um, things that I've um, seen is that we use regenerative energies and let's combine these um, probability, uh, pro properties and um, as I said, well, for academia, the we should we should try and find the democratic approaches where all, where all each computer has a say and uh, and then find approaches that um, do not have the energy problems and that will create a new currency dynamic. Now that is the kind of research that I conduct, but today I wanted to uh, place the focus on two really hackable ideas and really invite you to maybe take part. Now, to summarize, oh, I forgot this, um, even stronger requirements or stronger challenges are the privacy challenges. I had a talk yesterday. Building block sign, wichtiger sind dann so about a certain form of economy that could be a building block and certain knowledge protocols. Um, gibt es durchaus now that 
Schuli, das ist ein interessanter Ansatz für die Forschung, um die und ungeheuer nützlich zu machen. Um mathematisch und nützliche Forschung zu machen. Also, wieder, die Privatsicherheit zu schützen, braucht sehr gut durchdachte mathematische Ideen. Also, alle Mathematiker sind invited to take a deeper look. And then I said, proper cryptography. As I said, we should consider, do we want people with, with a lot of money enter the system and create a lot of, generate a lot of CO2, which on the other hand would stabilize the currency. That may sound horrific, but if you approach it cynically, you could say that the CO2 generation is quite strongly correlated with the value of the currency. So cynically said, if you're ready to to burn this and that amount of power for Bitcoin, then it is worth something to you. You shouldn't forget that either. The large power consumption does mean that Bitcoin, even against state attacks, has a certain amount of resistance and resilience and uh, the people that pay for hardware for mining bitcoins they use a technology in processor building but I'm going to be mean now but technologically they're, they're quite in the middle between Intel and AMD I think they have finer structures than Intel these days so in that regard it's quite interesting and, of course, also an offense to the mathematics community, because mathematicians always search for prime numbers with interesting properties, and a wholly failed brain coin system, which had as proof of work search for prime numbers, the fact that this failed so badly, even though it, it found chains of prime numbers with interesting properties better than, than the scientific community had, the fact that this failed is kind of denigrating to the mathematics community. Because you have people playing with this and producing nicer results than the scientific community had and then it failed. But that's not a very rare thing in the cryptographic community. Now, last slide to point out the positive sides. Regenerative energies have a number of properties. Digital currencies have a number of properties that go very well with regenerative power generations, generation that can go very well with grassroots economies. And let me say it like this. If we build this in countries, we should try to get privacy inserted as quickly as possible and to do it right. Just to go back to the M-Pesa example, that was very su successful. Uh, often criticized justifiably, justifiably but um, if you accuse these people of collecting all the data and not protecting them prop properly and then the response is secret services have the data anyway, but the problem is if secret services have it, a few days later the hackers have it, we now have the proof on the black market, so if we roll out something, then please use systems that are compatible with GDPR. Sorry, that was very mean. I had to insert an artistic interlude here. But joke aside, the GDPR, with all justified and sometimes too exaggerated criticism, Starting point does provide an interesting starting point, and again, protecting privacy in transactions is not an esoteric hobby for some people that want to show that uh, uh, that are not. It's not about the head of the rocker club hiding the fact that he collects Barbie dolls. No, this is about very sensitive data that is out there on the market and these 11.5 million data sets can easily be converted into threat mails and 
blackmail and a very simple experiment that I can run on these data and just if you just think for a couple of hours you can write a few Python scripts that can create an enormous amount of unrest. So my appeal to politicians is don't believe that society has matured enough to make the protection of private data obsolete if by writing a small strip I can bother all these people that have been involved in gambling. Sorry, if you're thinking of 11.5 million people then who then go, oh, oh, and just one per thousand, one per mil would then respond to blackmail, that would generate a lot of money too. Uh, the research about sustainable cryptography, let's look at the research there. There are some interesting ideas there and I said that data protection should be at the very base of it and that is work for everyone. Mathematicians should think about zero knowledge and computer scientists should start implementing these old protocols and we should all work together and, and talk to each other and try to make technology better. Thank you. Thank you very much. Also, eine yes, a perfect landing, Rudy, thank you. Now, sustainable blockchain instead of digital and dirty. Now, this is your applause. Für QA haben wir leider Now, unfortunately, there is no time for Q&A because he really used all his time, but you know how he looks now. He will use one of the exits because that's the only way he can leave the tent, so grab him. Yeah.